Now I know why you're here. You've watched my video on the number of parameters behind ChatGPT, and you get it. There are trillions of parameters behind ChatGPT, but you're still not satisfied. You still don't understand how is it so good? How does it actually work? How is it that it exhibits this impression of intelligence? Well, you've come to the right place. In the course of this little video series, I will explain everything. And by the end of this, I guarantee it, you will be satisfied. Let's get started. Now, much as last time, I'm going to give you a story. It's going to have three parts, but this time the parts are not going to be beginning, middle and end. This time the parts are going to be generative and pre-trained and transformer, because we are going to peel back the onion on each of the three aspects of ChatGPT that make it as powerful as it is. But I do have a quick warning for you. Growing up, I was a fussy kid. I didn't like broccoli. I know kids like broccoli, but I also didn't like tomatoes and I didn't like mayo and a lot of things I didn't like. But one thing I did like was a delicious pink sauce that my mother used to make. It went well with everything. It went with hamburgers, it went with salmon, with chicken. I would have that pink sauce with everything. And it was a secret family recipe that my mother would never reveal, but I didn't ask. I just enjoyed the pink sauce. I think you may know where this is going. I, many years later, I caught my mother making the pink sauce and learnt to my horror that the pink sauce was none other than two hated ingredients, tomato ketchup and mayo mixed together. That was it. And I was sorely disappointed and felt deceived and refused to, to eat pink sauce again. But my mother said, look, okay, so maybe it's not made from ingredients you find super delicious, but when it comes down to it, it's still the pink sauce. You still still love the taste. And that's what I'm here to tell you. I'm about to reveal the ketchup and mayo that is behind ChatGPT. And there's a risk that at the end of this, you're going to look back and say, oh, that's a kind of unsavory set of ingredients that makes this up. And I feel deceived. But I'm going to point out to you that when it comes down to it, it's still ChatGPT and the results are just as powerful and they speak for themselves, even if it's really ketchup and mayo. So let's start by talking about generative. So you remember last time I talked about large language models as being models which are trained a particular way. They're trained to expect inputs in the form of a series of tokens or chunks of characters. And their output is the most likely next token to follow immediately after the input. That's just the way they, they're trained. That's what they're, they're, they're trained to do. That's what they learn from data to achieve. And so we can explain the example I gave, I think, imagine that the sentence, the capital of France is, or the fragment, and, and imagine that each of those words are a token, which is often the case. So those are the five tokens we've got, the capital of France is. And now that is put into a large language model, which I'm showing here in the form of a mixing board. If you remember, we talked about it being very similar to thinking about mixers that are connected to mixers that are connected to mixers with trillions of parameters. And what comes out at the end of all that is the word Paris. Well, as it happens, I didn't tell you the full story here. I didn't exactly lie, but I didn't perhaps reveal everything to you. It's just one step more complicated than that. The model doesn't just spit out the word Paris. That's not quite how it works. What it actually does is it creates, it, it outputs probabilities. It outputs probabilities of every possible next token. Every one of the tokens that it, that it has in its entire vocabulary of tokens, uh, each one is given a probability. There are some that have very small probability. Presumably a word like gherkin would be a very unlikely word to follow. The capital of France is, but uh, presumably, hopefully, Paris is a word which gets a very high probability as being a likely next token. But there could be other words as well. This could be a sentence which is saying something like the capital of France is near, or it could be something which is saying the capital of France is the followed by some something that comes after that. And so words like the and near might get a small percentage probability as well. And there might be lots of other words that get a tiny probability, all the different ways that perhaps this sentence could be extended with Paris presumably being the most likely. 
And so to, to illustrate that, we can, we can say, all right, so what would happen then if we picked the word the instead of Paris? And what we pass into the model is the capital of France is the. Well, then for the next token, it will do the same thing. It will look not necessarily at finding one word to, to choose, but rather it will look across its entire vocabulary of possible next tokens and every possible next token even the word gherkin will get some probability. And perhaps it thinks this might be the capital of France is the fashion capital of Europe, or the, the capital of France is the most. All of these would be possible ways that the sentence might extend, and every possible token gets some probability associated with it. Now, the reason I make this clarification is that I want to make the model more tangible to you. The model, the large language model we've been talking about, is a type of neural network. So it's one of these layered sets of, of neurons layered on top of neurons, or you can think of it as mixers, connected to mixers, connected to mixers. In that very first layer of mixers, what goes in is a sequence of tokens, a series of chunks of characters. And what comes out of the last layer of the neural network, the output from that last set of mixers there, is a set of probabilities. It's numbers that represent the likelihood of the next token being every possible next token. And that might make it more concrete for you because you can start to imagine how similar to when we were talking about simple examples like estimating apartment prices, this is something which is coming up with a numerical value that represents probabilities of tokens. And during training, when it's seeing examples, you can see how it could shift around the probabilities so that probabilities of words it actually sees become slightly more likely. But now I'm going to make it even more concrete for you. I'm now going to show you something absolutely extraordinary. I'm going to show you ChatGPT answering a really hard question in a way that will amaze you. And over the course of this video series, I'm going to be looking at this same example in more and more detail until it's absolutely clear how it's able to achieve it. Let's look at the example. The example is this question. How would you describe the color blue to someone who's never been able to see in no more than three sentences? So I put this to GPT-40 and you can do the same thing. And this is the answer that I got. I got an answer. Blue is often associated with feelings of calmness and serenity, much like the soothing sensation of a gentle breeze or the peacefulness of a quiet ocean. It can be compared to the coolness you feel when you touch water or the refreshing sensation of a crisp, clear morning. Imagine the vastness of the sky or the depth of the sea, both expansive and tranquil, embodying a sense of openness and freedom. Now that's a great answer. And you might think perhaps it's regurgitating that from its training data, but you can ask it the question many times, you'll get slightly different answers or very different answers. And you can also ask a similar question to Claude and to DeepSeek and to Grok3, and indeed we will next time. Uh, and you'll see that all of them will wow you with their, their, uh, how articulate they are and also how poetic they are. But now, let's look under the hood for one second. So you may be surprised to see that I have some code showing now because I just want to give you a little bit of a perspective for what's going on behind the curtain of GPT. I've got code here which is running it's calling OpenAI, it's driving the process of generating the next tokens so we get some more insight into what's going on. And I've given it the question about how would you describe the color blue so that we can see how it's able to craft that seemingly human-like response. So this green blob here says start, represents the beginning of GPT generating its response, predicting the most likely tokens. And what we'll see right away is that for the first token, GPT has come up with a number of probabilities for all the possible next values. And the one that's got the highest probability is for the word blue. The probability for blue, you can see, it thinks it's a very likely next token. Uh, it's also given as the second most likely, the word imagine. So imagine might be the kind of word that might begin after a question that's put like this. And then the third one might surprise you, it's the word Des, 
Uh, and you might be wondering, what on earth is that about? Well, remember, these are tokens, not necessarily words. And some tokens represent fragments of words, a bunch of characters. And that des, I imagine, is a piece of describe, uh, because that would, again, be, uh, be answering this or describing or, or, or uh, something like that is what it thinks is a likely response to this question the way it's stated. So the word blue is the most likely word. And so blue is the one that's selected. And then the question is put back into GPT with blue at the end of it as the beginning of its response. And now it has to generate the next token. And this is what it comes up with. And you can see that is is the one that gets the highest probability. But there are other candidate words as well. There's can and there's often, because this could be uh, blue is, blue can, or blue often would all be possible continuations of that answer. And I'm hoping you're starting to feel like this is slightly less magical because you can actually imagine a kind of weighted uh, parameterized algorithm that maybe with enough examples would start to give higher probabilities for words like this. And indeed, if you're on your text, uh, if you're on your, your phone and writing a text message and you were being prompted for the next word after typing something like imagine or, or blue and you saw is or often, you wouldn't be that surprised. So to continue the story, blue and is are selected as the highest probability. And then again, we generate the next likely token. And the next one, again, there's a few possibilities, often gets the highest probability because when you have something like blue is, the next word is, is frequently, often. Uh, a is another possibility and like is another possibility. It could be blue is like, it could be blue is a, uh, but it was in fact the highest probability it gave was for blue is often. And then to keep going, blue is often associated. It could have been blue is often described. There is our desk from, uh, from before. Uh, blue is often compared. Uh, but it was blue is often associated. And so uh, that becomes the most likely next token and on we go. Blue is most often associated with, uh, and you can see blue is most often associated with feelings or with calm or with the. So here I'm hoping that you're starting to get a peek behind the curtain, you're starting to see the mechanics of this engine and some of the magic is beginning to fade because you're seeing that this process of assigning probabilities to the most likely next token based on everything that was seen at training time is a task which, which is quite achievable by something which is basically using lots and lots of stacked mixes. Uh, and it's something which has this amazing uh, power to come up with something that's remarkably coherent in terms of the final answer. And every time I run this, because I've, I've got a fixed way of calling GPT, I get exactly the same answer with the same probabilities associated with all of the tokens. So you really can get that sense that it is a machine. Some of the magic is fading. And so when you read all the way down through the diagram, what comes out is the very compelling answer that we saw earlier. But you shouldn't take my word for it. You should go and have a look yourself. I've put a link to the code. If, if you're willing, you can bring it up uh, and run this yourself. Look through each of the different edges on that diagram and see how the result, the outcome, is just the result of picking the most likely next token. And pull out your phone and, and go to the text messages and write a text message. Ask yourself a question like this and press the button and you'll see that it's nothing like as good. I mean, we're talking about technology that's many years behind, but you still get a sense of what's happening. What's happening is it predicts the most likely next token and the fact that there are alternatives that it could choose from at each point. Okay, so this is the first step of revealing some of the mysteries within large language models. Next time, we're going to talk about pre-training, the P in GPT. 
And in particular, there's going to be a couple of things. I'm going to explain to you what it means when I've talked about the sliders being wiggled, which is the way that, that these things are trained. You see an output, you realize it's not quite the output you wanted, and there's a technique for wiggling the sliders all over the mixing boards, the, the weights of the neural network, so that next time the probability of that token is slightly higher. And whilst it's a pretty simple technique, it is a very powerful one that leads to this kind of emergent intelligence that we're all now familiar with. So as I say, it's going to be about understanding, like this DJ, what it takes to wiggle those dials and affect the parameters to do better. And while we do it, we're going to do something pretty cool. We're going to take that same blue question and ask it to a bunch of models ranging from absolutely tiny models with only about 50 million parameters all the way through to the massive reasoning models like Grok3 that have only recently come out. And we'll be able to look at that whole spectrum and it's going to give you a moment when you're going to start to see Okay, so this is, how, this is how it feels as the complexity builds, as the responses become more and more coherent and, and more and more clearly articulated. And this is how we start to see this property of emergent intelligence. I'll see you next time.